The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and education. We will explore how African Americans who have been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity have succeeded. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr. Uh, with us today to discuss the Brown case are Jennifer Adams, Ph.D. candidate at the CUNY Graduate Center, Hazel N. Dukes, the president of the New York State NAACP, the Honorable Basil A. Patterson, former Secretary of State of New York State, and Ted Shaw, director counsel of the Legal Defense Fund, which really was involved in this great activity. We've seen and you've read and you've thought about what happened with Brown. Would each of you give your first reaction to Brown when it happened? Now, some of you weren't born at that time. Some of you were distinguished citizens at the time. Hazel, what was your first reaction? Well, being a Montgomerian and had experienced the lack of being in a segregated school, uh, books with uh, pages torn out of them, uh, in uh, facilities that wasn't uh, of quality, I said, hallelujah, mm -hmm. America now is living up to its true meaning. Uh, so I was elated when I heard and read, like most of the adults that was around me, everybody was applauding and thought it was a good step for America. Mm -hmm. Basil. Well, I think we all thought it was a, a significant victory. And I remember that the same day Thurgood Marshall held a press conference in which he announced that he thought within five years, schools throughout the nation would be integrated. And that meant in New York City as well. Hazel can talk about Alabama. Some of us went to New York City schools and we saw nothing but people who looked like us. And we never saw a teacher who looked like us. So it was a day of celebration. We thought it was a major victory. And it still stands out as one of the most significant Supreme Court cases of all time. But I think, and we'll get into that later, I'm sure, it, it augured well for other things, not necessarily for integrated education. Yeah, I'm fond of saying that uh, I became an American citizen on May 17, 1954, because Placey Ferguson, as they were saying, uh, had legalized segregation. So at least Brown says segregation is not the law of the land. Now, you younger folks, I'll start with you, Jen. When you first heard about this decision, what was your reaction? Well, actually, I didn't hear about the decision actually articulated until I was an adult, I'm ashamed to say. I mean, mm -hmm. I was aware of the history of segregation and what happened in the South. I really didn't think about it much, you know, growing up in Brooklyn. And as an adult, when I, I guess it finally, you know, was articulated to me that this was an actual decision that took place, it you know, caused me to question, I guess, my own schooling and my own experience growing up and going to school in Brooklyn. And we're going to talk a little later mm -hmm. about your experiences on desegregating schools <laughs> here in New York City. Ted, what was your reaction? Well, I, I was born uh, six months after Brown, so I was in utero when Brown was decided. <laughs> uh, and uh, I grew up with Brown and the Civil Rights Movement as the backdrop of the context of my youth. Uh, and so, for me, Brown always stood as this great moment uh, that divided American history into two unequal halves, mm -hmm. one in which African Americans were subjugated by either slavery or segregation, and another one in which uh, the law finally meant something, the Constitution finally meant something for African Americans. So it's been the context of my life. One of the unfortunate things in the whole history of Brown is that there was another decision, a uh, review in 1955, where the court said that the states could proceed with all deliberate speed to desegregating the schools. And that began the problem that we have right now. What was your experience, Hazel, in desegregating schools? You're from Montgomery, Alabama, the home of the bus boycott, the home of Hazel Dukes. Tell us about that. Well, uh it really didn't desegregate in the South uh, because just as they thought you had the uh, increase of Christian academies, 
the majority of the white community found a way to move their children and to move themselves. You know, housing mm -hmm. play a big part in this. And I remember living on a street, just about three streets that divided the Negro community mm -hmm. from the white community. And we would have gone to the same school if the state had used uh, the tools that the court had set. But instead of that, the whites m began to move, move out in areas that was not in that school district, and they began to build schools under the name of Christian Academy, mm -hmm. under uh, uh, different segregations names there. Mm -hmm. So it left the school, left the community, still majority Negro. Mm -hmm. So it was very little uh, 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 integration, even after the law passed. Now. Today in Alabama, uh, I visit there quite often, there is some increase in, in, in the integration of the school, uh, even at the college, Alabama State University now. Uh, they have just every nationality is there, even with the uh, professionals, even with the professors. Uh, they maintain an African-American uh, president of that college, but most of the staff. So I really never... Uh, had the privilege, and, and I shouldn't say privilege because mm -hmm. I had a good education. Yeah. All my teachers were black mm -hmm. and they cared. I and mean, they, I have doctors, lawyers out of my, out of my class, mm -hmm. kids that I would, Fred Gray mm -hmm. was a classmate of mine. And so, you know, I'm proud in a way that I live uh, through that because it made me, as Ted, uh, have the backdrop for him. It's the content that I, my life is guided by, mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. what, uh, segregation did, uh, what it meant to me and my family as African Americans, and it made me uh, strong in my resolve. Uh -huh. Basil? Well, you get so many different thoughts about it. We know that Brown did not desegregate the schools. We know that. You start with that. Schools today, uh, I think the numbers are They're right more now. They're segregated now. Over 70% right. of minority students attend schools that are 90 to 100% minority. So that's not uh, integration or as some of us used to call it, we weren't talking about integration. Got to understand, I grew up in Harlem and you had the separatist movement that was sitting there, and they were willing to talk about desegregation. They did not want to talk about integration, and it didn't matter. The concept was, if you integrate the schools, if you desegregate the schools, there'd be more resources going into schools mm -hmm. to improve education. But then you have an article recently in the New York Times where they talk about Topeka, Kansas, how the, the, the kids are not learning any better. The black kids are not doing well, even though the schools are across the board integrated. But then they mention almost as a footnote that the financing of the schools has dropped through the bottom. They're even below their own average. Teachers there would qualify for all kinds of federal programs of assistance. And we look around the, the nation and you see in our areas, in our schools, in the inner city, the underfinancing, the larger classes, the inability to really get to, to kids and teach them. That's why a lot of blacks are the same way. Some of us did better before. We did better when we had teachers who had an empathetic relationship with us so that it's a mixed up thing. When I come back to Brown meaning a great deal. Uh, I put Jackie Robinson and Brown together mm -hmm. as the beginning of the encouragement of the civil rights movement, the, the real motivation that we could achieve things. I remember marching in Montgomery many years ago and, and saying, my God, it's good to be able to get out of here. Mm -hmm. I was proud of blacks who were willing to march in Montgomery because it was dangerous or in Memphis and these other places. We could always get out. We'd go down there to join them, but we always came back to New York. In New York, you felt safe and things were a little more subtle, but we didn't go downtown. This has been a national problem. You know, the Brown case really was an evolution of a change of social attitudes on race. Uh, as the audience knows, I was a Tuskegee Airman, the black pilots who broke the barriers of segregation to become outstanding pilots and heroes in the war. As a result of that, President Harry Truman desegregated the armed forces in 1948. Then Jackie Robinson came into baseball with Branch Rickey in 47 and 48. The climate was changing, and in the various books that have been written about the decision, it was pointed out that if the decision had been taken three years earlier, the courts would have upheld segregation. But because of the pressure and because of a new Chief Justice, Earl the Warren. The death of Chief Justice Fred Vinson. Yeah, they got rid of Fred Vinson and yes. not got rid of I think he passed away. He died. He died and, of a heart attack. Uh, Earl, a year Earl before Warren the decision. from California, who was a liberal, was heading the court. 
And these social attitudes were changing, and that became the basis, together with the pivotal work of Kenneth and Mamie Clark with the doll study, where they did the study where they had black children to decide which doll they like, white or black, and what characteristics, positive or negative. And basically, they would select the white dolls, assign negative characteristics to the blacks. And the courts used that as a part of the social theory, saying that integration is wrong. It, uh, not integration, segregation was wrong, mm -hmm. that uh, the 14th Amendment, and Ted, you'll comment on that, uh, supposedly guaranteed everyone the right to the full liberties of a society. That was the context. Now, Jennifer, by the time you were going into elementary school, they were beginning to try to desegregate schools in New York City. Tell us about your experience. Uh, you told me you had some very traumatic experiences. Tell us about that. Yeah, I did. I didn't even know that I was involved in the process of desegregation <laughs> at the time. I mean, just to begin, I started off in a school, you know, PS 287, which is right across the street from my building. And I felt very comfortable there. My teacher had an afro, wore mm -hmm. bell bottoms, seemed to love me, mm -hmm. you know, and we had a great time. My mother sewed pants for her. Mm -hmm. Um, I really wasn't aware of race. I knew that there were some kids that spoke Spanish, but I never thought of them as being different other than they spoke Spanish and they had their ears pierced with little pretty earrings. And then, um, then I got bused to Bensonhurst and then my <laughs> life basically changed. I went to PS 186. I was the only black kid in the class. And, um, you know, it's funny that you brought up the, um, the doll case because I remember distinctly bringing my black Barbie doll into playing, you know, to play when everybody brought their Barbie dolls in and no one wanted to play with my Barbie doll because mm -hmm. it was a big thing for everybody to switch off Barbie dolls and play with each other's dolls. And, you know, what we did, we all put our dolls in a pile and everybody would pick somebody else's dolls and my doll was always the last one left and I ended up playing with my own doll. And, um, you know, and that was just you know, just an indication of what the overall experience was. Everything that I, you know, I never seemed to do anything right. I went from being like a straight A student to being a satisfactory student at the school. And I remember crying every day, um, you know, just being different, just being, um, you know, just put apart from the other students. And even when we went on school bus trips, you know, it was the thing that the only person that really did sit with me was an Irish-American friend of mine, and she lived in a black neighborhood. So she was kind of different because she lived in a black neighborhood, and she was probably one of the only white families there. And we ended up getting along really well, but sometimes if she didn't get to sit with me, then the parents would sit with me. And I always felt like they were treating me as a charity case, mm -hmm. when I never felt like I needed charity because my parents, you know, they worked and took care of me. and. Um, you know, I went to school always well-dressed, my hair was combed, everything, but they always kind of took me as, you know, this poor black child, you know, within the context of all of the other kids. And I even remember one day, one of the students saying to me, Jennifer, don't you wish you were white? And this was just in the second grade. And as an adult, I think about that, and I think, well, what made him think to ask me that question? And he must have saw the way that I was being treated by the teacher, by the other students, um, by people in the neighborhood because we would, the bus would drive through, we got eggs thrown at the bus, we got sticks um, beaten at the bus. And I remember they were these huge guys that lived in Bensonhurst, you know, these huge like Italian looking guys. And to me, they were big grown adults and they would beat the bus with hockey sticks. You know, we got called the N-word every day. One of the buses actually got almost tipped over. I remember another very bad memory of my friend Antoinette who was a sixth grader at the time and for some reason I don't remember what happened but you know she had to get dropped off at a, the train station I think we were involved in an after-school program so the bus didn't take us all the way home and when she got off the bus one of these big men kicked her in the stomach and this is a, a sixth grader and these guys were like, you know, they were like these weightlifting, like Gold's Gym guys. And this is a six, a small sixth grader. And he kicked her in the stomach. And You know, Jennifer, yeah. as you describe this, uh, I really hurt for you and all of those thousands and thousands of other black young people who went through mm -hmm. that. It really relates to what you said, Basil, about the fact that they didn't really want to integrate the schools, mm -hmm. they were desegregating the schools, and as children, it's folks like Jennifer, when she was a young girl, who experienced this. This is really 
very, very painful. And I think the public has to understand this because as we celebrate Brown as this great opening the door of equality, we re remember just like in any war, there are casualties. And some of the young people were casualties. Fortunately, you survived. You're a PhD candidate. You are a professional educator. But the fact is that so many didn't. And right now we are seeing the thing. backlash of that in some of our communities, sort of the self-hating behavior. Mm -hmm. Now, Ted, tell us about your experiences with desegregation. And you can even go into some of your legal work where you tried to enforce desegregation. Well, I, uh, I've been practicing law now for 25 years, and I started off with the Justice Department and Civil Rights Division under the Carter administration mm -hmm. when school desegregation was still being enforced in the South. Uh, that rapidly turned around when President Reagan was elected, and uh, it became time for me to leave justice, and I, uh, I joined the Legal Defense Fund in 1982 and headed up the education docket there. I litigated school desegregation cases all over the South and also in uh, other areas of the country, including the beginning of the case in uh, Yonkers, New York. Um, uh, I argued the last school desegregation case that the Supreme Court uh, decided in, in 1995, Jenkins versus Missouri, which comes out of Kansas City. Uh, so a lot of my professional uh, legal career was spent litigating school desegregation cases. Uh, the uh, the thing that most Americans don't really understand, I think, is that uh, Brown really was about desegregation at its core. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of confusion, and yes, uh, we wanted quality education, but there is no constitutional right in this country to quality education. There isn't. Most people think that there is. There's no uh, constitutional right to education that is recognized. Uh, that's why the Supreme Court in 1973 said in San Antonio versus Rodriguez that A, education is not a fundamental right, and B, it said that economic status is not a protected classification under the Constitution. In other words, the Constitution is silent when it comes to discrimination against poor people. So when we talk about uh, property tax-based school funding schemes, uh, like most states have, and uh, they produce inequality because wealthy districts, you know, they do more for their children and poor districts don't have as much. Uh, the, the federal constitution doesn't say anything about that. Uh, you know, I think we need to revisit those issues. In the meantime, school desegregation was used as a way to leverage change and influence on districts that otherwise would not do anything about uh, educational inequality. Uh, so, for example, uh, very quickly, in Kansas City, uh, Missouri, at the point that the school district became majority black in the mid-60s, that was exactly the point at which uh, the last tax levy and bond issue was passed because the majority of the electorate remained white even though the school district was majority black. And so you had black folks inheriting a district without the ability to fund it. Mm -hmm. So it's a much, much more complex issue than a lot of people think. It's just not about putting white kids and black kids together because there's something special about white kids that rubs off on black kids and views them with the ability to learn. That, that's not what it's about. There's like been a certain amount of romanticism day. about the Brown case. Yeah. And what I was going to ask you, Basil, you're very insightful about racial attitudes. Has the Brown case had any influence on changing racial attitudes in this country? Of course it has. Only a fool or a charlatan would say there hasn't been progress in that area. The problem is how much progress. Mm -hmm. Sure, it's changed it. But enough? Certainly not. They used to say that the young kids who were running around saying things had to happen overnight, that they were impatient. It turns out they weren't impatient. They were realists. And unless it happened then, it wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. No, the mm -hmm. attitudes have changed not sufficient for this country. I mean, we could go item by item, state by state. We can talk about politics, the influence of race in politics, which I happen to think is overriding, not only in our domestic policy, but in our foreign policy. But I'd like to get something that Ted made me think about. The Detroit case, where they talked about where there was a Supreme Court case in, in Michigan. Millican versus Bradley. You got it. Where they were going to integrate the suburbs mm -hmm. within the cities is the only way you're going to get real integration. And what they do? The Supreme Court knocked it out. Knocked it out. And what would that mean? White flight became a part of life. 
Those who could afford it moved further and further out. What they do? The tax burden increased for those who yeah. stayed. Had to pay more to maintain the roads, more to patrol the roads, more for pollution control, you name it. One other thing I'd like to mention. As we talk about attitudes and where we're going, we know we make progress. But I think it was Ted I saw quoted once talking about for every step forward or two steps forward, you get a step backward. And that's what we're fighting right now. As Elaine left his press, as Elaine Jones, who's director counsel of the Legal Defense Fund, she made a statement about where we are now. We are losing the interest in helping the poor and those who need assistance. And the impact of the war in Iraq on our society, we're not going to be able to measure it for many, many years. We worried about McCarthyism in the 50s. Take a look at what we've got now. You have neo-fascism right now. Well, in the way in which you said it. I didn't say it. <laughs> okay. now, uh, I don't know why. It's Hazel, you and the New York State NAACP have done a wonderful job in terms of fighting battles for racial equality. What's your perception about how racial attitudes have changed since Brown? Well, I have to agree with uh, Mr. Patterson. Uh, Ted mentioned Yonkers. <laughs> Let's check, take Yonkers. We've had uh, five cases in Yonkers, from school to fire to housing. I mean, uh, national NAACP has put more money in Yonkers than I think they did in Mississippi. We're talking about up south now. They put more money. Uh, ben Hooks, before he left, said, what in the world is this Yonkers? And you've seen what happened in the last two years. A African-American ran for mayor there, thought he had a good chance. Uh, he had been this, a superintendent of schools in that area. Just a myriad of things. And then look at Long Island, where Mr. Patterson and I spent a lot of our years out in Long Island. That was Hempstead. That was Roosevelt. Uh, then there was over in the North Shore, where I lived, the Roslyn. Uh, the attitude uh, was a group of liberal whites uh, saying that they would help African Americans. We had got to be well, blacks. We weren't African Americans yet. Mm. Well, it was help blacks uh, with their children in education. It was a small amount. Uh, I remember uh, Chuck Williams and uh, lived in Roosevelt and uh, uh, Bert Mitchell. So you had a, a educated group of blacks in that community. When they left and integrated into white communities, mm -hmm. Those communities became all poor, with no tax base. The political end of it, there was an in, Roosevelt was made an incorporated village. I mean, it's just been continuous. Really. And it's currently under state supervision. Vision. And, and, and the NAACP has been in Roosevelt for, me, for many years, or working there. Mm -hmm. And they've taken some steps forward. And now we are backwards. Mm -hmm. The school has gone backwards. Uh, let me talk about uh, out in wine dance. Uh, we, we spent years in wine dance, the late uh, Dr. Eugene T. Reed, who was the president of NAACP, and Bill Booth under his tenure, spent a lot of time out there in, uh, in, in those areas. And those areas today, the blacks who could make it out of poverty left those areas. And now those areas are poor again. Mm -hmm. uh, the welfare rolls are high there. You have an increase of uh, Hispanics moving into that community, so it's tension there. Uh, the political system uh, out in uh, Suffolk, there's not a African-American in that county serving in any political. Uh, Nassau has done a little better. They have uh, men and women on the county legislature there. But when you look at the years of Lincoln Lynch, CORE in that area, uh, the five brands in that area, things did happen. But now, when you look at those same areas, the Hempstead, Mexican, the tax base is high, the school system is just a mess. You look at the areas where we spent time, money, and energy, and at a point, at a peak in the late uh, uh, 60s and 70s, we had made some inroads. And you look at the late 80s, and the late 90s and, and 2004, those areas are back to where they was during the time of, of when I read the history from Eugene Reed and, and, and Bill Booth and Donna Lee, which I look at every so often. And then let me go to Brooklyn. 
which is the Mecca, if you will. Let me do Dr. Uh, Dr. just add one thing. Uh, Ted Shaw made a comment earlier about the federal constitution does not provide for equality of education. But a matter that should concern all your viewers and everybody who lives in New York City right now is the campaign for fiscal mm -hmm. equity lawsuit brought against the state. Which is based on the state constitution, which That's says a point. sound, basic, basic education. education. But the, which was the interpreted, governor said. No, no, it wasn't the governor who said it. He, he applauded it. But the interpretation of sound, basic education uh, made by the, the judge who wrote the case, Supreme Court, quick. Uh, we know Leland him. deGrasse. Leland deGrasse, it reads like poetry. Mm -hmm. It's a great decision. It is. But the appellate division then overruled him and said, a sound basic education, that's the equivalent of eighth or ninth grade, because all you need is the ability, you only need to provide is the ability to vote. I don't know what age or education is to vote, and to serve on a jury. Well, with, uh, we're talking about all kinds of technology. Now, you have to have some kind of a serious education to serve on a jury intelligently. But then the Court of Appeals overruled the appellate division. We now have a mandate that the state should provide money for the city. Now, everybody knows that New York City was given less money than it was supposed to get through the years. I don't remember the exact numbers, but like New York City 34, might qualify. 34, 38. Yeah. yeah, they qualified for about 37. They were getting 34 percent of the state monies for education. And now they're talking about it, and nobody's coming to the decision. Uh, one estimate by one commissioner is that it's going to cost five and a half to nine billion dollars. Uh, that's a great estimate. I, mean, I could make that estimate without having a study. And they, it's going to be money. It's not just desegregating schools. The concept that a lot of us had when the schools were desegregated was to put blacks in schools with whites was to have the power structure, have more concern about educating all the kids in that school. Now we've seen it hasn't worked that way. Now we know that we must get the resources into our schools to provide our children with the kind of education that makes them competitive in our society. Now, Jennifer, you're part of the younger generation. Mm -hmm. What is your take on the change, if any, degree of race relations in America, in New York, in Brooklyn? Well, in Brooklyn, I really don't see that there has been much change, I guess, for my school, because I think Brooklyn is very provincial. You have all of these very segregated neighborhoods, you know, people mm -hmm. that live in a neighborhood according to ethnicity, you know, and there are many neighborhoods, you know, Bensonhurst has changed a little bit that I think there have been more Russian and Asian immigrants that have moved in there, but the schools there still remain predominantly white with the Asian mm -hmm. and Russian immigrants. And I've heard like, um, you know, one time I had a colleague that was from Bensonhurst that worked in a school that I taught and she would always comment about how horrible the Russian immigrants were. So there's that still attitude that's there in certain neighborhoods about people who are not like them. Mm -hmm. You know, that very, um, you know, close-minded attitude about people who are considered others or outside. So I really don't think that it's changed much. And I even saw that in my, um, my tenure as a teacher in um, a large public high school in Brooklyn, where there was a small group of white students there and they were all put in the honors society, I mean the honors classes, mm -hmm. no matter how non-honors mm -hmm. they were. And, you know, and they had a separate prom, you know, they had a, their own guidance counselor. All of these kids were very much like, you know, hand, made, you know, they were hand fed, made sure that they had their college applications. Whereas the other students, if they didn't have concerned teachers like myself and other African-American teachers, they would have known nothing about the college application process. You know, they probably would have all went to one of the community colleges when they were intellectually capable of going to a four-year college and even getting scholarships to some of these colleges. But, you know, they weren't a part of the honors corps. You know, read, they weren't white, so they really didn't get that special treatment. There were like, you know, a couple of tokens in the honors course. And this is very, um, you know, it's, it's this very horrible to think that considering that this school was predominantly Afro-Caribbean American. Mm -hmm. You know, it's probably 60% African American, Caribbean American, maybe 40% white, and 40% of the whites, they were all in the honors program. So I don't think it has changed. Now, Ted, <laughs> you're the people's lawyer in this case. <laughs> We've had the Supreme Court decision. We've had various decisions afterward to try to enforce desegregation. 
we have heard from everyone here that things are worse or at least as bad and maybe worse than they were before. And a lot of it comes from racial attitudes in our society. You're the legal guru. How would you go about attacking this? Well, first let me say, I, I think that, um, I think in some respects things are worse. In other respects, they're not. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like a tale of two cities. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. Uh, it would be a mistake to uh, underestimate the change that Brown and the Civil Rights Movement wrought. Well, tell us what it is. Well, I want to hear this because we've been hearing some negative things around well, the table. You know, what are some of the fact, positives? In fact, uh, after uh, about almost two decades of evasion, many public school districts throughout the South were desegregated. The problem is, is that they have resegregated because yes, of court housing. decisions that allow them to resegregate mm -hmm. and a lack of public will. But in the meantime, uh, many students uh, did get desegregated education. Now, even that was a mixed story. I mean, you know, the, the, the kind of experiences that you had, mm -hmm. uh, that, that was an exp that you know, we had those experiences elsewhere. Uh, but uh, look, we got more black folks, we have more black folks in uh, positions that we can only dream of in 1954. We have five uh, or six uh, black CEOs of major Fortune 500 companies. We have blacks uh, at every level of government, uh, just about. Uh, and uh, we have black folk in corporate America as well as in academia and in medicine and science. You know, the, the, it's been tremendous change. At the same time, we still have a tremendous amount of segregation. Uh, we at the Legal Defense Fund are attacking issues like tracking, discriminatory mm -hmm. tracking, discriminatory discipline policies, uh, the kind of school, the prison pipeline that we're beginning to see now, mm -hmm. where African American students are really targeted at a very young age, tracked into non-academic courses, mm -hmm. um, uh, disciplined in ways that are often uh, discriminatory and uh, the assumption is that they're never going to be productive and they're set up to go right into the the uh, penal system. Uh, you know, we've got to stop this over-incarceration of African Americans that uh, is being carried out in the name of the so-called war on drugs. Uh, I don't want to get too far afield, but it's related. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, Legal Defense Fund believes that we are going to have segregated schools now in this country. We have them. Uh, it's a decision that the country has made by either choice or default. And ironically, uh, the challenge now is to make those schools uh, not only equal, but uh, to give them more resources. Because where you have concentrations of poverty, mm -hmm. which is largely a black phenomenon, mm -hmm. you know, those school districts don't need equal funding. They need more, they need more funding. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the challenges mm -hmm. that we face these days. And finally, uh, we are fighting attempts to make even voluntary desegregation illegal and unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. Our adversaries are trying to, uh, to knock out even voluntary desegregation plans. I'm not talking about mandatory busing. Those days are all but over. Uh, but things like majority to minority transfer provisions, uh, programs like METCO up in the uh, New England area, up in Massachusetts, that have been challenged. Uh, we had one case in which uh, white parents challenged a school board's uh, consideration of the desegregative or segregative effect of locating a new school mm -hmm. in one place rather than another, which is exactly what the Supreme Court said school boards should do in 1971. Their argument was that's race conscious therefore racist. You know, it's the same argument that we faced in the Michigan cases, which stands fact in history on their heads and distorts the reality of what's going on. So those are all the struggles we have. Uh, but I, I also want to add that litigation, while it's necessary, is not a panacea. Mm -hmm. You know, Brown was decided the way it was, not just because of the legal issues, but because of a political context. Mm -hmm you know, and in part because of the Cold War context. Uh, and we need to create a new political context uh, and try to address these problems through political pressure. Uh, we'll keep doing our part.
uh, you, litigation. Not only you keep doing it, you've done it extremely well. Well, thank mm -hmm. you. But this whole conversation really points up the cruciality of race in American society. Race in American society goes back to the Constitution. Blacks, slaves were constituted as three-fifths of a person. Uh, all of the major decisions, the Dred Scott decision, Placey versus Ferguson, said blacks are second class. Now, what Brown really said legally is that blacks are first class. Every citizen should be first class, but the population has not internalized that. And even in the black population, we're getting a class differentiation in the black population. Those that Ted pointed up who've uh, benefited from integration, desegregation, and those who are captured in the urban and the poor communities. So that sort of we can look somewhat positively to the future. This is a pivotal time, 50 years after blacks were declared legally first-class citizens. Mm -hmm. Where do you think we should go, Basil Patterson? Well, Dr. Brown, I'm reminded of a wasn't a speech per se. It was an impromptu comment, a series of comments made by a lawyer named Tom Todd, if I got his name right. Mm -hmm. I think he represented Jesse Jackson years ago mm -hmm. in Chicago. Mm -hmm. At a conference in Washington, he got up in front of all the black congresspersons and said, you know, all the, all the legislation we've ever gotten in this country that was progressive came as a result of almost upheaval and a mm -hmm. pressure from the streets. And he went down everyone, the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voter Rights Act of 65, the National Housing Act of 68. And then you have Derek Bell who talks about the interest conversion, convergence, mm -hmm. where white leadership yields when it's fearful of upheaval. I used to call it the politics of discomfiture. If we discomfort the white leadership, they're going to start yielding on some things. But I'm not as confident now as I was maybe 20 years ago. I do believe that street activity has great meaning. And by that I'm talking about people mobilizing, people being militant, people pressing hard. Because I think Ted earlier, when you were testing your sound system, was quoting Frederick Douglass. Douglass said, without struggle, there is no progress. Without demand, there's no yielding. Mm -hmm. And we do not have to believe, and should not believe, that those with the benefits are going to give them up voluntarily. Why should they? If we were sitting in their position, we wouldn't do it. They're giving them up when they're forced to. And how's that force come? When people pressure them and explain the morality, the ethics, and the good sense in America of having a true democracy. We are spending time imposing a democracy or attempting to impose a democracy on a country by using force of arms. We don't have democracy here. Someone's going to get, jump up and yell, oh, we have democracy. How is it? I'll give you a quick illustration. How can you have an overwhelming majority of Republicans running the New York State Senate, an overwhelming majority of Democrats running the New York State Assembly in the same state, and the people are voting in the same places, not say because the district is gerrymandered. Mm -hmm. That's the reason. They don't like to turn, but that's what it is. So if we're going to talk about democracy, if we're going to talk about fear and equal treatment, we're going to have to earn it. We're going to earn it by fighting for it. And if there's any other way, I'd like to hear it. I've never seen it work. Now, Ted, you were involved in the affirmative action case in Michigan, where affirmative action was really affirmed by the Supreme Court by one vote. And many of the people who were supporting that were people in the corporations, feel that they needed a diverse workforce. People in the military feel they needed a diverse workforce. Is this concept of diversity helping all of us to move ahead a concept that we can embrace? Let me, let me. Well, I, first, let me just point out something that was uh, ironic, or perhaps not ironic. Uh, but the most powerful brief in that case was a brief filed on behalf of former military officials. It was authored by Virginia Seitz, whose father was Colin Seitz. He was a chancellery judge in the Delaware case mm -hmm. that was part of the Brown cases. And he's the only judge, that was the only case in which the plaintiffs had won below and went up to the Supreme Court as appellees. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, that's interesting as a historical backdrop. Um, I think that the Michigan cases are significant because it signaled by a narrow margin the fact that uh, the country does not want to go back to where it was before. Now, it was close, 
But I think when Justice O'Connor walked up to the precipice and looked over, and she understood what was at stake, what was at stake, when you forget about all of the legal complexities, she understood that if they ruled the other way, that meant access for black students and for Latino students, but particularly for black students, to these selective institutions was going to be almost shut down. And I think she did not want to turn around. Corporations understand what's at stake now. This country isn't going to have a majority in the middle of the 21st century. Uh, it's going to be uh, a plurality. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're almost there now. Uh, so we've got to find a way to include everybody, and that's what these struggles are all about. Uh, the, there's a difference between desegregation and integration and diversity, and diversity is kind of the, you know, that's, that's the flavor of, of, of the day. Uh, and I, I support diversity, but uh, it's, it's not enough to talk about diversity because it's good for everybody. I think we have to continue to talk about the imperative that, that grows out of the history of white supremacy and the suppression of African Americans and the intergenerational effects on African Americans because even when in Michigan is not going to do everything we need to do, it's not going to take us to where we need to go when we talk about these attacks on programs that are specifically for black folks, you know, scholarship programs, pipeline programs, et cetera, that are remedial programs, not remedial in the sense that these folks aren't good enough, but in the sense of overcoming the history of exclusion. Uh, you know, diversity is nice, but it's not going to get you to where you need to go to protect those programs, and we still need to protect them. Jennifer, what's your take on the future? Well, I think that, um, I think we're heading in the right direction now, but I do think, like, you know, just to echo what some of, you know, other folks have said on the panel already, it's a matter of, you know, increasing funding in schools that need to have that increase in funding. I also think, I guess, speaking from an educator's point of view, that a lot of the programs in general that have been taken out of the schools that do feed to the multiple intelligences of, you know, all students, but in particularly our students, you know, the arts programs, the sports programs, I think a lot of those things need to come back into the schools. Um, I think that as far as in New York City here, like being aware of, um, you know, like the diversity of the student body and taking advantage of that and not just using it as like, you know, a multicultural curriculum, like an add on, like, you know, mm -hmm. you're going to say, oh, well, the African Americans did this and the Chinese did that. Make it a true integrated curriculum that shows mm -hmm. the, um, all of the things that people have contributed to society and especially in New York City here. This is a great place because everybody has contributed to making the city mm -hmm. the great city that it was. So why not allow, you know, the schools to show that, you know, why not, put, you know, put mm -hmm. money in that area so that the schools can really teach that to students so that they, you know, like African-American students or immigrant students don't feel like they're just here taking advantage or taking charity from somebody. It's interesting, when you were talking about your early experiences, you said you'd never heard of the Brown case decision mm -hmm. per se until much later in your education career. That's a classic example. This Brown versus uh, Board's 50th anniversary is an ideal time for teachers and communities to talk about this. But what this means is that you have to talk about race in America. Mm -hmm. Race in America is difficult to talk about. We can talk about race in America when we talk about jazz music. We can talk about race in America when we talk about athletics. We can talk race in America when we talk about the military workforce. But when it comes to talk about race in America and equal education opportunity, so entrance into selective schools, entrance into professions, that becomes sort of a no-no. So what can you, Hazel Dukes, do to help our society talk more and realize more about race in America? I think just what you're doing today, uh, educating people, but I go back to Mr. Patterson. I think our community has become too complacent. Mm -hmm. I think that we now must go back and take charge of ourselves, take charge of our communities. Uh, I have been a proponent that uh, I didn't have the opportunity to freedom schools. Uh, one of my coworkers, James G., had a freedom school mm -hmm. uh, in Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe that uh, we will have freedom schools now, but I think our uh, organizations, our uh, religious institution, should open up uh, in the afternoon for tutoring for our uh, children. Mm -hmm. I think that our educators, retired, should come back and uh, support our young people. 
uh, in this instance. Uh, we have several uh, branches of NAACP is just doing that because that's been one of my mandates. But I believe that we got to get back to the old landmark. We got to go back to Albany. We got to be in the streets here in New York uh, saying loud and clear what is wrong and how we want to be accepted and, and treated uh, like other groups are doing. And no one is going to give it to us. Uh, we're going to have to be persistent and take it. You and I share a lot of time at, uh, with the new Board of Education, with the new chancellor and the mayor. And I think that we've done it well. But I think we got to come out of Tweed Building and come in front of Tweed Building because nobody is really listening in Tweed Building. We go there for focus group and we are talked at mm -hmm. or talk over. Mm -hmm. uh, people think that whatever they say, we are to take it and believe it. Uh, the uh, social promotion issue. I don't know any African American wants social promotion, mm -hmm. but we want the resources. Mm -hmm. We don't want our children just to be left back because mm -hmm. that's the pipeline. The third mm -hmm. grade is the pipeline to you will look in the next few years and see those children who are being left behind in the third grade now will be going to Rackers or be going to the mm -hmm. probation department. Mm -hmm. So I think we got to come out of the Tweed building now. We've given the people the courtesy, we give them the opportunity. We were against the community school boards. It was a, a, a divided equally in our community mm -hmm. about the community school boards. Yeah, there were a few bad, few was good, but we can't let that stop us. Mm -hmm. We got to save our children. They're the next generation. A few CEOs, we ought to have many more than we have, mm -hmm. and they are out there. They're ready to become lawyers and doctors. But we got to make the way that somebody did for us. We got to go back and pave the way for our children. And we're not celebrating Brown. We're commemorating Brown. Right on. Basil, what message would you give to the viewers who are watching, black and white and Latino? What is the message for the future? Again, I go back to Frederick Douglass. Agitate, agitate, agitate. Well, the average citizen... I am not, Dr. Brown, I want to tell you. Yeah. I'm not optimistic about yeah, where we're okay. going. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. Ted made a very interesting point about five or six CEOs we have. We know who they are, Richard Parsons and Ken Schnall mm -hmm. and O'Neill, and you go through them. And I worry that they're being used to prevent advancement of other blacks. Because mm -hmm. they're going to say, what more do you want? That's mm -hmm. the SWV report when they found the NAACP. <laughs> yeah. What do Negroes want? Yeah. What do we want? We want decent jobs, yeah. decent education, mm -hmm. decent housing. We want what everybody else wants in their life for their children and their families. Mm -hmm. We want that, but how do we get it? That's the key question. And the question you don't get by sitting around just gabbing with each other. Mm -hmm. You get by what Hazel said, get in front of, mm -hmm. of the Tweed Building, the Department of Education. Go down to the man of the mayor. Make some noise in this town. Make some noise all over this country, because otherwise we're not going anywhere. What about younger folks like yourself, Jennifer? How do you feel about it? Do how do they feel about it? Well, I think that, um, you know, we, we do feel the same way that there is not that sense of protest that, like, you know, went on in the 60s and 70s. I mean, we see it on TV. And um, that we do need to start making our voices known because a lot of us have, well, I'm not myself, but a lot of us have kids that are in the schools now that are of that school age approaching third grade, you know, where that crucial decision is being made. I also think about us making on... Um, you know, career choices or, you know, choices within our careers that are going to help to improve or to make that voice, you know, known for the students, the younger ones that can't speak for themselves, you know, about like going into education, you know, going into medicine, mentoring mm -hmm. younger students, you know, being involved in allowing students to, be, you know, come into where you're working and show that this is really a possibility because there are not Unfortunately, in our communities, there aren't a whole lot of role models that are there, but it's about those of us that I think that are educated, that are in professions to help to bring others into the fold, to help to show them that this is a possibility. Ted, what do you think? Well, I think we have to do it all. I think mm -hmm. we have to become politically engaged, that we have to vote. I think we have to uh, use our, our money in our communities. Uh, it's not that we don't have money in the African-American community. It's what we do with it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we need to uh, do it on a macro and a micro level. We need to read to our children. We need to be up in our schools and, and pressuring those schools. And those of us who don't have children in schools still have an interest in making mm -hmm. sure those schools educate our children collectively. 
uh, we have to support the organizations that work on these issues, and I, I'm unabashed about saying I want people to support the Legal Defense Fund, uh, and Hazel would say that mm -hmm. about the NAACP and all the other organizations. Um, and I think that uh, uh, we have to do what other groups do, which <laughs> is use economic and political power uh, for our interests. And the African American community gets attacked when we try to organize as African Americans mm -hmm. in a ways that other institutions, other communities don't, you know, as if it's illegitimate. You know, we, we have to throw that off, ignore that, and organize uh, as our community interests dictate. And finally, I think we also have to address the growing class and inequality and equity in this country. The gap gets larger and larger. Poor and working class white people often cut off their noses despite their faces, don't see the common interests they have with people of color, particularly African Americans. Uh, we have to struggle around that issue. I think that's a good point in which to summarize our discussion today. We've been talking with Jennifer Adams, PhD candidate at CUNY, uh, Ted Shaw, Director Counsel of the Legal Defense Fund, Hazel Dukes, the President of New York State NAACP, and the Honorable Basil A. Patterson, former Secretary of State of New York State. The summary message for our audience is the one that everyone has been saying. Power concedes nothing without a struggle. And that is our role as African Americans 50 years after Brown versus Board of Education.